In this video, we will be taking a dive into Michael Jackson's indelible reign as the king of pop. How did he attain this monumental musical status exactly? What efforts did he make to market himself as the king? And how did this shape his career as well as legacy as a global superstar? Here's the detail. If you were to ask Michael Jackson himself, you may receive an answer similar to what he told Oprah Winfrey during his historic live interview in 1993, that the title was first attached to him by his longtime friend Elizabeth Taylor, who, during 1989's Soul Train Awards, introduced him as the king of pop, rock, and soul. And in my estimation, the true king of pop, rock, and soul, Mr. Michael Jackson! His king status was then legitimized by fans, who would follow him with signs and chanting his new noble title. A satisfactory explanation for many, although his journey to king status wasn't quite as natural and organic as he originally let on. In fact, the King of Pop label wasn't really gifted to him in 1989, but the title had been floating around the artist far earlier. Most significantly during his groundbreaking success with the Thriller album, in 1984, once Michael Jackson achieved the highest selling record of all time, won the most Grammy Awards an artist has ever received on a single night, and Michael Mania had truly swept the nation, Michael was consistently named in news outlets the King of Pop, or variations of, during a period he had truly conquered pop music in the 80s. However, the status of King was never gifted to Jackson as an everlasting title, but merely reflected his chart success and popularity at the time. Articles speculating who was next to dethrone the Billie Jean singer would soon circulate, with many pitching Prince and others against Jackson in this pursuit. Despite this, the status of king wasn't even the most popular term Michael Jackson was associated with during the period. In fact, many journalists saw him as a refreshing contrast to the hedonistic lives that for so many years characterized the world of rock and roll. As Stephen Holden from the New York Times wrote, quote, Elvis the king of rock and roll, the man who brought aggressive sexuality to the center of popular music, was remembered as an unofficial American monarch, our one and only show business king, who died of his own earthly excesses. Michael Jackson, the delicate, androgynous man-child, is today's icon of pop music. But if Presley was modern pop's symbolic king, Jackson is surely its symbolic savior. Michael Jackson's humble demeanor, puritanical values, and childlike presence led many to compare him to the boy that was destined never to grow up, Peter Pan that is. Often being labeled as the Peter Pan of pop, journalists made much of Michael Jackson's enchanting public persona that had previously only featured within the pages of fairy tales. This only strengthened when articles circulated that Michael Jackson was being considered by Steven Spielberg to play the whimsical character in a big time movie adaption. Jackson's friend Jane Fonda told Rolling Stone at the time, quote, I remember driving with him one day and saying, God, Michael, I wish I could find a movie I could produce with you. And suddenly I knew. I said, I realize you're Peter Pan. And he started to cry and said, you know, all over the walls of my room are pictures of Peter Pan. I totally identify with Peter Pan, the lost boy of Never Neverland. However, over the years, such references slipped out of public consciousness as Michael Jackson continued to dominate the 1980s music scene. References to Michael's magic childlike sensibilities were soon overshadowed by increasingly salacious stories detailing business and family dramas, alleged plastic surgery disasters, the elephant man's bones, and images of the superstar in a supposed oxygen chamber. New labels were being attached to the artists in the tabloid press with far less noble connotations. Despite Michael Jackson's trailblazing moves and sustained popularity, descriptions often characterized the artist as weird, bizarre, and crazy. The nickname Wacko Jacko constantly preceded the artist and was used as a means to publicly mock him for his eccentricities. 
Once he had completed his ambitious Bad World tour and new negotiations began with his record label, Michael Jackson was eager to memorialize the groundbreaking feats he accomplished throughout the decade becoming increasingly preoccupied. With the state of his legacy as an attempt to counteract the public image onslaught he was being subjected to in the tabloids, this is when the King of Pop title had its renaissance. First by Elizabeth Taylor, and then Michael Jackson himself. After signing with Sony Music in early 1991, the largest recording contract in history, Michael Jackson was preparing to solidify his reign as the King of Pop with a release of his dangerous record. Jackson hoped to do this by instructing VJs, publicists, and writers to make reference to the King of Pop title, efforts his record label was less than keen on. Dan Beck, a former executive at Epic Records and part of Jackson's marketing team, was worried the push for royal status would hurt the pop star's career. Quote, Believe me, we were trying to talk him out of it, Beck said. Our feeling was that radio was just going to roll their eyes and say, screw you. As predicted, such bombastic moves to cement Jackson's lofty title caused a considerable backlash, particularly when said instructions were leaked to the press. Carol Robinson, vice president of publicity for MTV, confirmed that someone from Jackson's organization asked them to refer to Michael as the King of Pop whenever he was mentioned, stating, quote, It was a request, not a deal. He's the king of pop. Print advertising and televised commercials also included references to his royal status. Jackson himself taking part in a symbolic ceremony and publicity stunt, where he was crowned king while on a non-touring visit to Africa in 1992. Eric Snyder from the St. Petersburg Times remarking, quote, The king of pop says who? Says Michael and his image makers, questioning Jackson's motivations behind the move. Quote, it's perplexing that Jackson Inc. would go to such great lengths to secure his regal status. It just underscores the fragility of the man and throws further doubt on Jackson's commitment to his artistry or at least questions the balance he puts between personal expression and commercial success. Raising the question, why was Michael Jackson so insistent on establishing his position as King of Pop during this period, despite the opposition he faced? Well, it's no secret that Jackson had a fascination for anything and everything to do with royalty. His brother, Jermaine, stating that Michael's happiest moment in his life, at one point at least, was when he was introduced to Her Royal Highness Queen Elizabeth II in 1977. This only trumped when Jackson would go on to meet Princess Diana before a concert in London as part of his Bad World Tour in 1988. His personal style was flamboyant and regal in nature, dressing in glitz and gold as well as royal military-type ensembles. Michael Jackson also had himself memorialized in several works of art characterized by their regal settings. It's clear that Michael was anxious to take control of the image the world would remember him for, a king denoting prestige, power, and an enduring stature, but also had associations with other interests like fairy tales, magic, in kingdoms far, far away. If Michael Jackson could benefit from the trailblazing accomplishments he achieved in the 1980s to memorialize himself as the King of Pop for the 1990s, he hoped this legendary status would somewhat exempt him from relentless pop star comparisons, chart battles, and expectations for him to constantly outdo himself. For an artist who, even as a child, dealt with the immense pressure to perform growing up in the spotlight with personal relationships whose existence was conditional of his commercial performance, Michael craved freedom, peace of mind, stability, and ultimately, acceptance. All things he found in the world he created for himself behind the gates of Neverland. When in the 1980s, Michael Jackson was music's antidote to Elvis Presley's excesses, by the 1990s, Comparisons between the two stars became increasingly apparent as Jackson developed into another king himself. Both artists grew in their celebrity and commercial stature. Large entourages trailed them, private lives remained mysterious, living in suspended realities only a king could ever have the power to construct for themselves. 
However, this sense of the untouchable Michael Jackson, cultivated as part of his King of Pop persona, only made him even more tempting of a target for tabloid journalists. The insidious desire for the press to knock the rich and famous off their pedestals ultimately erupted when allegations were made against Michael Jackson during the summer of 1993. The higher your position, the harder the fall. And within a few short months, Jackson's extravagant yet fragile world fell around him as he battled a criminal, financial, and personal nightmare of catastrophic proportions. Daily dramas were eagerly unraveled by news outlets and speculated upon as part of Michael Jackson's humiliating and very public dethroning. When that chapter closed and the case was settled, Michael Jackson was determined to once again reinstate his position as the King of Pop. In an act of defiance, Michael pushed harder and further with the release of history, as his public image became increasingly extravagant. His lyrics more cutting and aggressive, the music videos more expensive, and his live performances more glorified, in an attempt to performatively embody his innocence and counter the mounting levels of negative press. Pursuits that only fostered an increasing polarizing public image, as Michael Jackson became an elaborate caricature of his former King of Pop self. Upon the release of Jackson's 2001 record Invincible, David Brown wrote in Entertainment Weekly an article titled, Why Michael Jackson is Not the King of Pop. In the article, Brown expresses how at this point, the term was almost exclusively being used to delude the artist or mock Jackson in its absurdity, as his reign as the King of Pop music had surely come to an end. Quote, pioneer of pop, perhaps, or godfather of pop. What little music Jackson has produced in the last decade didn't exactly uh, reign. Yet Jackson continues his fixation with king of pop, which has become symbolic of his failure to realize that he, like many pop stars before him, have their massive moment in the sun, the moment passes, and their careers carry on regardless. However, after Michael Jackson's sudden death in 2009, the King of Pop title came back into public favor, as dedications and celebrations of his life and music heralded him the King, suggesting that such titles are often best bestowed in death as a tribute to the artist's retrospective career. Today, Michael Jackson is often seen as the undisputed King of Pop which is embraced and sustained commercially through countless marketing and merchandising endeavors. But this title has also been legitimized as Michael Jackson remains as one of the world's top earning artists, even in death, as his artistry continues to be enjoyed by fans and discovered generations new.